Welcome, everybody. It's uh, fantastic to see you here. My name is Stuart Points. I'm the director of the School of Communication, and um, this is the fourth in our series of keynote talks to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the School of Communication. Um, we'll have much more to say uh, about tonight's event in a moment, but it's a great honor uh, to welcome Dr. Sarah Benet Weiser to the School of Communication to SFU and to Vancouver. And Sarah has without question done some uh, incredible work to get here and be with us. So we're really grateful to have her. Uh, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. As some of you will know who have been to previous uh, 50th anniversary events, um, we have uh, offered up uh, an indigenous welcome by elder, as we've come to learn, elder in training Morgan Guerin. And unfortunately he isn't able to make it this evening. He was with us for the alumni event and it was fantastic. And so um, by way of getting ourselves started, I want to acknowledge that the School of Communication and Simon Fraser, indeed this evening's event, are uh, respect, res we respectfully and with gratitude work on the shared traditional Coast Salish lands of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations, as well as the Coquitlam nations in Vancouver and Burnaby. We also acknowledge because our event is uh, being recorded through the servers, the Kaitsi, the Kwantlen, the Coquitlam, the Kakite, the Musqueam, and numerous Stolo nations in Surrey. I want to acknowledge the way that um, Morgan Guerin, um, who has photo I'd like to share with you, um, for those of you who haven't met Morgan, and for those of you who will be at our um, uh, research symposium that I'll say more about, Morgan will be um, offering uh, an Indigenous welcome at that event, that Morgan has really set the ground for a, uh, uh, a welcome in the way in which Musqueam nations offer a calling together, a gathering together. And I want to mark that because when Morgan has done that, that's allowed us to begin in a way of generosity, in a way of togetherness, in a way of kindness. And that's something that has been felt in the room, and I want to hold on to that as we begin tonight's event, even in Morgan's absence. His um, support and um, guidance for us has been tremendous. As many of you know, we have been underway over the fall in celebrating the school's 50th anniversary, and it has been an exciting uh, range of events. Among those things that some of you will have been able to take in as part of the 50th anniversary is our digital timeline. Uh, the digital timeline is now online. It's a history of the school, and as always with history, it's imperfect. It's to be um, added to. It's an iterative timeline that's meant to um, create conditions for others to add work to. And so I mark that just as a way of saying, please, um, if you haven't visited the timeline on our website, do so. It's a fantastic overview of the 50-year history of the school. And any of you who see things missing, events, key people, please reach out to us. We are more than willing to update and add material to the timeline to give a fuller and more robust history of our school. I also want to acknowledge the uh, alumni celebration we had a week and a half ago now, which was an incredible event that brought together layers of the school's history and reminded us of the, of, of the genuine um, care and kindness many of our graduates uh, continue to have towards the school. And it reinforces a sense of mission and a sense of vision for what we do together. Tonight, we're very grateful um, to uh, welcome um, Sarah Benet Weiser with us. Her talk, When Intersex Intersectionality Becomes Brand, uh, will be introduced and moderated by Dr. Milena Drumeva, who I'll say a little bit more about in a moment, as well as uh, responded to by one of our great um, doctoral students, Hornaz Keshavarzian. And Hornaz schooled me in how to say her last name, so I've been practicing for days. Um, <laughs> It's good, it's good, I've got it, I've got it now. Um, as part of our opening, I'd like to share with you a setting up of how we've um, organized our celebration of the school's 50th anniversary. Some of you will have heard some of these words before. For some of you who are new this evening, um, I hope they give you a sense of what we've been trying to accomplish. The present historical moment is set upon, as we know so very well and feel in a way that is uh, filling us with anxiety, pain, a sense of uh, trauma, is set upon by a series of cultural, economic, environmental, health, and political crises that have challenged our ability to care for each other and imagine a common democratic future. Many of these crises are not new, 
but are the result of the ongoing legacies of colonialism, imperialism, heteronormativity, patriarchy, racism, and capitalism that persist across societies. In this context, the critique of power and the terms and conditions of contemporary mediated life is more pressing than ever. Throughout its 50-year history, SFU's School of Communication has sustained a rich and vibrant tradition of critical communication research, teaching, and engagement that aims to make visible and disrupt structures of power while contributing to the coordination and development of progressive social change. This is our legacy. Across this work, the process of critique has been taken up in a variety of ways to address the political economy, technologies, cultures, discourses, and institutional and normative structures and practices of communication that shape societies around the world. It's in the light of this history that we've taken up communication as critique as the central thematic guiding our celebration of the school's 50-year history. Critique as we understand it is disruptive it is clarifying, it is liberating, hopeful, and absolutely essential for fortifying the kinds of collective, democratic, and diverse futures we, call, we are called upon to defend and struggle for today. Over the past decade or so, the school has been revitalized by the addition of a group of brilliant new faculty members who have brought renewed energy and diversity and necessary change to our ranks. We continue to be inspired by and sometimes led by our remarkable students, one of whom, Hornaz Keshavarzian, you will meet this evening, for those of you who have not met Hornaz yet, as part of Sarah's talk. Some of the colleagues and friends who have helped to shape our school over the past 50 years are no longer with us. While some have recently retired, leaving behind a legacy of enviable scholarship, teaching, and community that's helped to shape the field of communication in Canada and around the world. Over 50 years, our aims have been to foment the kind of change that will make the, for a better world, especially for those who have long been excluded from the opportunities and possibilities of a just and equitable future. It's in the celebration of this rich and deep history that we've assembled a program of activities to mark our 50-year anniversary. Across this celebration, we've aimed to focus on four distinct areas of critical scholarship and teaching that have been hallmarks of the school, these include work in the areas of global communication, intersectional research and teaching, the critique of technology, and work that aims to foster social justice. Tonight, we continue our celebration with a talk broadly in the field of intersectionality by Dr. Sarah Benet Weiser, who will speak on when intersectionality becomes brand. To help moderate our session with um, Dr. Benet Weiser, it's now my pleasure to introduce associate professor, friend, colleague, Dr. Milena Drumeva. Milena. Well, thank you all for coming. And um, today we have the incredible privilege to hear from Dr. Sarah, Sarah Benet Weiser on a topic very much close to home in so many ways uh, when intersectionality becomes a brand. A reminder, in the words of Sarah Ahmed, of the unfinished nature of social action. And I'll leave it at that because the talk will speak for itself. But um, I want to introduce you to uh, both of our, both our speaker and the respondent today uh, by um, telling you a little bit about them. Dr. Sarah Benet Weiser's teaching and research interests include gender in the media, citizenship, consumer culture, popular media, race in the media, and intersectional feminism. She's a distinguished professor at the University of Pennsylvania and the Annenberg School for Communication, and professor of communication at the University of Southern California at the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. Committed to intellectual and activist conversations that explore how global media politics are exercised, expressed, and perpetuated in different cultural contexts, she has authored or edited eight books, including the award-winning Authentic, The Politics of Ambivalence in a Brand Culture, and a beloved book of ours, Empowered, Popular Feminism and Popular Misogyny, as well as dozens of peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, and essays. I think many of us really are quite familiar with your work. 
uh, and are so excited to have you here. In 2019-2020, um, she had a regular column on popular feminism in the Los Angeles Review of Books. Um, and I want to preemptively introduce our respondent today as well, uh, our very own PhD candidate, Hornas Keshavarzian. Hornas Keshavarzian is a PhD candidate and community engaged research initiative fellow in the School of Communication. Her research is focused on feminist media studies, specifically the intersection of grassroots feminist movements in the Middle East, North Africa region, embodied activism, and transnational feminist coalitions. Her book chapter has been published by Rutgers University Press in Media Culture in Transnational Asia. Okay, so the format tonight uh, will be as follows. First, we'll have about 40 minutes, a 40 minute talk by Dr. Bene Weiser. Um, then we'll uh, move to a panel conversation where um, Hornaz will um, serve as a respondent and have uh, about two rounds of questions uh, with our speaker that um, I will help moderate. Um, that will go on for about 10, 15 minutes. And then uh, I'd be happy to take some questions from the floor and um, we'll take as many questions as time permits. I'm sure we'll have a very lively discussion. And so in the interest of uh, budgeting time for that, I, without further ado, will give the stage here to Dr. Bene Weiser. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for that introduction. Thank you, Stuart, for inviting me. Thank you, Joanna, for arranging for everything. Um, and, and just, it's a real honor to be here to celebrate the 50th anniversary um, of SFU. I'm going to talk a little bit um, from a chapter um, that I wrote with my co-author, Zoe Glatt, um, about branding and intersectionality. Um, and, and also talk a little bit about the kind of the, the theory of intersectionality itself. Um, and I'm looking forward to our discussion and to whatever questions uh, you all might have. By the way, this is just when I Googled intersectionality, shopping for intersectionality. I didn't make this up, this is just a screenshot. Um, and I'm not gonna lie, I kinda want those intersectional feminist socks. Not sure what they will do for me, but I'm thinking they'll do something. Um, okay, so um, in uh, March 2005, in the first season of the US version of the television series, The Office, an episode titled Diversity Day aired where the politically insensitive boss, Steve Carell's Michael Scott, required employees to undergo diversity training. Each person was required to tape a card to their foreheads that was labeled with an identity, an ethnicity, or a race, ranging from the vague Jewish, Asian, and black to the narrowly specific Martin Luther King Jr. The episode is uncomfortably humorous, with the show's characters awkwardly using racial stereotypes to, draw, to try to guess their colleague's race. Actor Larry Wilmore, who, was, who played the uh, corporate diversity officer that was hired to conduct the training in the episode, was interviewed in 2020, and he was asked if he thought the content of that episode could be made in today's current political landscape. Wilmore responded with a hard no, and he said, absolutely not. There is no way Diversity Day could be produced today and probably rightly so. So I begin with this because it is probably true that such a crass and highly offensive kind of diversity training could not happen in a cultural and national context after years of the Black Lives Matter movement has gained tragic traction in the recognition of police brutality against black people, and in a moment when white nationalism has gained a massive and visible following across the world. 
Indeed, the presence and often mandated of mand uh, mandated institutional and corporate diversity training has massively increased since 2005, although in the United States, that is, um, diversity training is now under attack after the SCOTUS decision against affirmative action, but it still is part of a kind of corporate world and higher ed world. In part, this shift has to do with the hard work many communities of color have done to call attention to institutionalized racism, widening wealth gaps or income gaps between white employees and employees of color, and the casually racist environments of most workplaces. But it also has to do with another cultural phenomenon, and that's what I'm gonna talk about tonight, the marketing and branding of the concept of intersectionality. And I want to say ahead of time that I'm not judging anyone who has any of these products, because I have this mug, okay? So um, it's just, you know, this is kind of the whole world of popular feminism. So in this talk, what I want to explore is, is what is lost when corporate culture takes hold of a complex political concept like intersectionality. And I want to think through the limitations of what Rupali Mukherjee and I have called commodity activism w through this lens. I'm arguing here that the move to brand intersectionality is a move that does not examine nor challenge structural relations of power when it comes to race and gender, but is rather a strategy, one that narrowly focuses on identity as a way to build a brand and to accumulate both economic and cultural capital. The branding of intersectionality Far from feminist legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw's definition of the concept, which is in part, and I'll talk more about her definition in a minute, about taking into account, in her words, multiple grounds of identity what, when considering how the social world is constructed, the branding of intersectionality instead follows precisely what Crenshaw states is not what intersectionality means when the problems of exclusion are addressed simply by including black women in an already established analytical structure. This already established analytical structure in this context is neoliberal corporate capitalism. So later on in the talk, I'll take two kind of examples um, of, of the branding of intersectionality. Um, with it were two cultural and, and commercial realms. One, the individual branding of intersectionality and social media, especially in terms of white female influencers, and the corporate branding of intersectionality where corporations brand themselves as intersectional through what Hoskin calls performative anti-racism. First, though, I do want to kind of go through, um, uh, before we get to how the rich concept of intersectionality becomes distilled um, and contained in order for it to have consumerist efficacy. Um, I want to talk a little bit about intersectionality itself as a concept and theoretical analytic. While the term intersectionality is widely attributed, again, to feminist legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, the core logic that undergirds this concept, that systems of oppression are interlocking thus creating intersections of struggles rather than singular axes of struggle has been, have been a key element in black feminist thought for many decades and they continue to be a key element in black feminist thought. As uh, the feminist scholar Brittany Cooper points out, quote, the idea that patriarchy interacts with other systems of power, namely racism, to uniquely disadvantage some groups of women more than others has a long history within black feminism's intellectual and political traditions. I just smiled because I think someone came into the wrong room and they're like, listen, listen sister, I don't want to talk about intersectionality right now. I got something else to do. <laughs> um, and, the, and it just started, wait till they get to my video, right? So, okay, so in just a few examples, we can see how, for example, in the 1970s, the Kumbahi River Collective theorized an interlocking of struggles and made the powerful argument that this interlocking was, formed the conditions of the lives of women of color in the U.S. 
Patricia Hill Collins, in her masterful text, Black Feminist Thought, argued for what she called a matrix of domination and said that the subject position of black women was often seen as the outsider within, making a gesture towards to the ways in which the positionality of women of color is always about intersections of power. Crenshaw, of course, coined the term intersectionality in 1989, um, and I'll talk more about what that concept for her was about. And then more recently, Boya Bailey, along with activist Trudy, has coined misogynoir to articulate the specificities of what it means to be the target of misogyny and racism for black women. And I'm pointing to these just few examples, and there are many more, right? Um, just to broadly gesture to the ways in which intersectionality has a history. It has a history in, within black feminist thought, and as I will argue, it's precisely this history of the structural dynamics of power that is distilled or erased in the branding of intersectionality. So Crenshaw argues against what she calls the single axis theory this idea that structural issues of power are limited to one facet in this axis, such as gender. And she argues that that erases the experiences of black women. She also argued that the intersectional experience is greater than the sum of racism and sexism, meaning that, in her words, any analysis that does not take intersectionality into account cannot sufficiently address the particular matter in which black women are subordinated. So she coined this, th this theory to talk very specifically about the experience of black women. She theorized, uh, um, she theorized intersectionality along three dimensions, structural, political, and representational. Um, and she said that it's you know, what, which part of what her argument in most uh, recent years has been is that most people have taken up intersectionality at the level of representation, at the level of identity. And she has argued from the very beginning that it is all three of these levels, structural, political, and representational, um, and only then if you consider all of them and the ways that they connect, can you actually have an intersectional approach. So just very briefly, you know, she makes, she makes clear that intersectionality should not be taken as some kind of new totalizing theory of identity, but rather it's about demonstrating the need to account for multiple grounds that, you know, when considering how the social world is constructed. So briefly, structural inter intersectionality refers to a convergence of race, gender, and class domination, wherein social interventions that are designed to ameliorate the results of only racism, only sexism, or only poverty would be insufficient to address the needs of, a, of women of color marginalized by all, by the interaction of all three systems of power. So she gives many examples, among them domestic violence and immigration, and she's you know, talking about how these structural intersectionality is built in the structures of everyday life. So it's not just about identities, but about how lives are organized through structures like education, like the law, like politics. Political intersectionality, on the other hand, looks outward to highlight that women of color are situated within at least two subordinated groups. And these two subordinated groups are often in conflict with each other, with conflicting political agendas, right? So part of what she's arguing here is that we need to look at political intersectionality to see this conflict and to ask how it may be reconciled. She uses here an example of Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas, and the idea that Anita Hill could not be both a woman in the case of sexual harassment against a Supreme Court nominee. She could not be just either uh, just a woman or a, a, a black person, right? But that's how she was cast. It was either that, either a woman or black, not both and. So she wants, you know, she, she argued this to think about how political intersectionality structures um, the lives of women of color and says that without this, you are leaving women of color without a political framework. 
And finally, representational intersectionality refers to the cultural constructions of identity, including the production and contemporary critiques of identity. So here I see the media being the primary context for representational intersectionality um, and its multiple dimensions. It's the political economy of the media, who owns the media, which often determines what we see and what we hear, what are the texts, what is the content of the media, and how do we as audiences understand and receive media representation. So her argument here was that the failure to begin with an intersectional frame would always result in insufficient attention to black women's experiences of subordination. This in, you know, and here also in representational intersectionality, the implicit distinction being made between personal kinds of identity and structural and political identities is a really important one. The law, for example, conceptualizes people through the structural identities of gender, race, sexual orientation, national origin, and so on, which is different than personal identities. Right? It's different than how we position ourselves in the world or how we are positioned in the world. This personal identities in, in terms of intersectionality is the key component involved in the process of branding intersectionality. Again, this process follows exactly what Crenshaw states is not intersection, what intersectionality means. That when the problems of exclusion of women of color are addressed simply by inclusion, right? Simply by the inclusion of black women into an already established structure. Branding necessarily targets individual consumers. So here I wanna trace some of the ways that intersectionality is distorted and transformed into something that depends on corporate visibility rather than collective politics. The cultural and media strategies that are involved when branding something like a political concept like intersectionality shares a history with other political movements that are branded and marketed. So this, as such, this version, the branding of intersectionality is part of what I have called the economy of visibility and empowered, which was mentioned earlier, where visibility as a political concept is not seen as a means to an end, but rather it's seen as an end in itself. Visibility becomes the politics. So the representation, the representation of intersectionality becomes an end in itself, severing ties with both politics and structures. Now, of course, imagining and crafting political concepts as commodities is not a new phenomenon. But the specific shape that this imagination takes is contingent upon the historical and cultural and economic conditions from which it emerges. What is or what is not appropriate to brand in the marketplace shifts depending on cultural conditions. So when popular feminism becomes something that we see in the media a lot, we have Dove right, who get, offers us a, a, you know, kind of a commercialized feminism. We have always, in their ads, about, you know, a kind of popular feminism. We have Colin Kaepernick and Nike and the, the kind of ways in which that became a brand, he became a brand for them. We have LGBTQ flags on everything, right, um, in, in, in terms of corporate culture. So while intersectionality has been commercialized as part of popular feminism, and Black Lives Matter has existed as a social movement for many years, in this conjunctural moment, we witness a more complex branding ter terrain, at least in the global north, where intersectionality has become an important element in not only advertising and self-branding, but also in corporate business plans. This multi-layered branding of intersectionality, like so much of brand culture, empties out structural racism and sexism as well as cultural context. So in other words, the branding of intersectionality focuses more on the brand than on intersectionality, following the logic of what or sociologist uh, Herman Gray has called the politics of recognition 
within a popular field of representation. So rather than a recognition of the black female subject within juridical structures of power, which is what Crenshaw is arguing for. So this popular representation of intersectionality has its own branding logic. So it makes sense to position the, intersect the branding of intersectionality within a continuum that includes the branding of feminism. And to think through the ways that these kinds of brand strategies deflect attention from the collective politics of feminism, anti-racism, and intersectionality, and instead reroute attention to individual identity and neoliberal logics of inclusion. And the branding of intersectionality often depends on precisely these neoliberal logics of inclusion, where a complex understanding of intersectionality as relating to structural relations of power is obfuscated in favor of a bland focus on diversity. And indeed, intersectionality is often collapsed with diversity in a corporate capitalist context. OK, so to move on into really thinking what this looks like, in September of 2020, the American academic Jessica Krug, a white woman, wrote in a confessional medium post that circulated online that she had passed as black for her entire career. Krug's story was one in a series of public outings of white people passing as black, including Rachel Dolezal, who many of us have heard of, who was at one point the director of a local NAACP chapter. Writing about the Krug case, Jason English states, and it's kind of worth quoting his, uh, him at length, the black identity has become standardized, commodified, reproducible on an industrial scale, tailored and marketed to flatter the projection and needs of its white audience. Much as hip hop has remained subversive in posture while its political core has shriveled like rotten fruit, rotting fruit into a soundtrack for the crudest mainstream capitalist values, the mainstream iteration of black identity has likewise become something to fill display windows, the artificially ripped and acid washed trappings thrown on a faceless mannequin. The idea that the mainstream iteration of black identity has become something to fill display windows particularly resonates in a context when stores and companies literally filled their display windows with statements about Black Lives Matter after George Floyd was, Floyd was murdered in May 2020. As black feminist scholar Francesca Sobande has, co coined, has coined the term woke washing to describe the various marketing campaigns that, that draw on feminism, anti-racism, and social justice, to market and sell products and brands as, as woke. As she says, brands make use of black social justice activism and intersectional feminism in the content of marketing that predominantly upholds the neoliberal idea that achievement, social change, and overcoming inequality requires individual ambition and consumption rather than structural shifts and resistance. Wokevertising and femvertising yoke rhetorics of black social activism and popular feminism to brands and products, capitalizing on the relative visibility of anti-racist and feminist activism throughout the 2000s. This kind, again, this kind of branding marks the move from the politics of visibility, right, where visibility can be a qualifier to politics, to the economies of visibility, where visibility is the end in itself. The relationship between consumerism and a particular version of feminist politics has only increased its reach with the advent of social media. In order for feminism to be marketable, the radical potential of feminism has to be distilled and contained as a product, which typically has meant a safe, palatable, and white mainstream feminism. As Koa Beck has pointed out, feminism had, had to become transactional, something you could buy, obtain, and experience as a product, rather than an amorphous feeling that rushed in 
from cha challenging power. So popular feminism, as I have argued, is often more about this kind of individual identity, something you can buy, obtain, and experience as a product, right? Then it is about a collective politics. It's resulted in popular feminism remaining at the level of visibility rather than a challenge to structural forms of power. This version of, po of popular feminism is deeply entwined with whiteness. As Catherine Rottenberg has written about the relationship between neoliberal feminism and whiteness, femvertising and wokevertising um, involves a calculative matrix of personal wealth, occupation, leisure time, access, or what Gia Tolentino calls the optimized individual. So these are just some of the kind of popular feminism things that circulated that were about that are about individual confidence. Just be confident, wear com you know, wear confidence like makeup. You know, I mean, I, I I always hesitate to critique Beyonce and anything that I I think about, but this one, you know, no, Bay, no, no, no. Um, I choose beautiful, Emma Watson, this kind of, um, you know, this, this way in which it's about the individual and the optimized self, right? The visibility of the Me Too movement has also been critiqued as a movement undergirded by whiteness. And given the visibility of white feminism over the past hundred years, the connection between popular feminism and whiteness seems quite clear. But what happens when something that is not typically connected to whiteness, like the concept of intersectionality, what happens to this within the consumer, consumerist branding process of social movements? I'm arguing here that the branding of intersectionality still remains a core of whiteness. The branding of intersectionality in the 21st century is often a reactive move, a strategy to contain public unrest and public boycotting. Right? after a spectacular expression of blatant racism, whether that be an unarmed black person killed by police, a tone-deaf ad campaign which defangs and obfuscates structural racism, or a social media influencer who capitalizes on a heightened visibility of Black Lives Matter to create edgy content and gain more followers. So the branding of intersectionality is typically a move that is all surface and no substance where neoliberal logics of capital accumulation undergird reputational management in a moment, in a cultural moment, when the everyday, when everyday structural racism that all people of color endure is brought into bold relief. The idea that, as Vox recently um, headlined, intersectionality has gone viral, needs to be considered seriously. Like many viral moments, there is heightened attention and a whole lot of money afforded to specific instances of racism. This functions to not only erase history, but also to shed a light on singular acts of racism by a cop, a celebrity, a social media influencer, without ever interrogating how those singular acts are merely one in centuries of unquestioned acts of racial discrimination that have been sedimented into law, into policy, and into everyday life. So I think I'm gonna show a video here. You may have seen this video. Um, if not, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> even if you have, you're welcome. Um, it's worth seeing, um, again, this is by Pepsi, um, as a way to think about what branding, what the branding of intersectionality looks like.
Okay. I'm just leaving my rec recommended um, next video up there, which is calm. Um, I think it's like directly tied to my blood pressure when I see that video. Um, there's, <laughs> there's a lot there um, about sort of what diversity looks like in corporate culture, right? It's all very friendly. You know, you've got like, you know, the, the, the Asian man playing the cello and the, and the black break dancers and the white guy playing the electric guitar all at a protest, right? Um, and, you know, Kendall Jenner, who is, you know, going to a protest that is ostensibly about racism, just casually throwing her wig at the black woman for her to pick up as she walks out and, and you know, uh, takes her stance and gives the cop the Pepsi, right? Branding intersectionality is a strategy wherein mainstream iteration of black identity has become something to fill display windows. English's use of display windows indicating not only personal displays on social media, but also gesturing towards media campaigns to brick and mortar shop displays clearly points to the neoliberal corporate logic of the strategy. Okay, so in 2020, during the heightened global visibility of the Black Lives Matter movement after, again, the murder of George Floyd, by police officers, many individual influencers responded to the moment. Framed as displays of support, white influencers took photos at protests, painted their faces in blackface, and displayed other forms of performative activism. In a Guardian article titled, Stop Treating Protests Like Coachella, an activist commented on the increase of influencers capitalizing on the visibility of the movement saying, quote, some people have co-opted the BLM movement in order to get content. And the problem with that and why it out enraged people so much is that it is the single most egregious act of cultural appropriation you can imagine. Repurposing your presence there for content strikes me as one of the most shallow things you can do. And bless you. Um, uh, one, of, <laughs> one of the most appalling and misguided examples of appropriative self-branding was the wave of images and videos of white beauty influencers painting themselves in Black Lives Matter makeup looks, including blackface, police brutality-inspired cuts and bruises, and messages such as hashtag BLM, I can't breathe. Another example is a white nail artist who tweeted images of nails featuring the face of George Floyd and the words, I can't breathe, offering the option of either matte or shiny. Even when black women tweeted, stop turning black pain into nails, makeup, or whatever other aesthetic functions, the artist did not take down the tweets. Again, these kinds of posts are widely, are, were widely condemned by black feminists, Black Lives Matter activists, and the broader social media influencer community as reinforcing the very racism that they claim to disavow, and for centering the self-promotion of the influencers who posted them. As photographer and popular beauty influencer Alyssa Ashley put it on Twitter, black people's trauma and reality isn't a makeup trend. But this point is crucial to the argument I'm making here about the representation of intersectionality as an identity. The examples of individuals, businesses, and institutions that I'm kind of looking at here all have one thing in common. They utilize anti-racism and intersectionality as a branding exercise only when they have something to gain from it and not at any other time. By self-branding as anti-racist and participating in the representation of intersectionality, they accrue social, cultural, and economic capital. So during this same time, when again, the BLM movement was gaining so much global traction, um, companies, like influencers, felt obligated and entitled to publicly support the movement through their products, their campaigns, their statements despite a historical lack of support or even awareness of racial justice. As YouTube content creator Nathan Zed put it in a video titled Black Lives Matter is, is Trendy Now, 
We've got to the point where companies feel obligated to say it or else they will lose money. When, what has Call of Duty ever cared about my black life? Call of Duty and me getting called the N-word while playing Call of Duty go hand in hand. It will say Black Lives Matter in the loading screen, and then the whole game is going to a brown country and shooting people up. We're in a phase where it's basically like there's a monetization of Black Lives Matter, a commodification of Black Lives Matter. Examples of this commodification included Unilever-owned Unilever Ben & Jerry's Justice Remixed flavor, Netflix's Power of Storytelling uh, campaign, you know, where you see here their tweet, to be silent is to be complicit, Black Lives Matter, um, and the complete rebranding of Pepsi by PepsiCo of the Aunt Jemima name and logo. As the, Pepsi, as the PepsiCo subsidiary Quaker Oats put it in a public statement, as we work, towards to make, as we work to make progress towards racial equality to, um, through several initiatives, we must also take a hard look at our portfolio of brands and ensure that they re reflect our values and meet our consumers' expectations. So while appearing to be progressive, so this was Aunt Jemima Pancakes for years, and then in 2020, they rebranded it as the Pearl Milling Company, right? Um, while appearing to be transgress pro progressive, the statement betrays the real impetus for this rebranding after 131 years, right, of racist, with a blatantly racist image and name, right? It's the, the real impetus is meeting consumers' expectations. This move was not about creating meaningful structural change, but it was firmly situated with the, within the realm of representing intersectionality and reputational management. Perhaps the most literal example of this kind of representational intersectionality came in the form of the black squares individuals and corporations posted on their Instagram accounts in June 2020. Hashtag Blackout Tuesday was ostensibly about not posting on social media, using the time to, quote, think about the ways in which many non-black Americans benefit from structural racism. This was represented visually in, the, in posting the image of a black square on Instagram accounts. So despite the intentions of the campaign to encourage this kind of re, uh, reflection, social media, I would argue, maybe people will argue with me about this, is not a particularly useful platform for con thoughtful contemplation. Um, instead, hashtag Blackout Tuesday became more about performative allyship with individuals and companies not only using the, the uh, hashtag Blackout Tuesday, but also tagging it and utilizing other hashtags such as hashtag Black Lives Matter and hashtag BLM. As activist Ariel Pardes points out, collapsing multiple hashtags into Blackout Tuesday also collapsed the activism of those hashtags using, in her words, hashtag Black Lives Matter when posting black squares and boycotting social media erases the work activists have done on social media to share resources with communities. The posts have completely taken over the hashtag Black Lives Matter. So rather than encouraging social media users to reflect on intersectionality, Blackout Tuesday demonstrated one way in which hashtag activism can be malleable, interchangeable, and diluted in the representational landscape. Another emblematic example of the shift in the political branding landscape following George Floyd's murder was Starbucks' complete U-turn. In early June 2020, Starbucks banned its employees from wearing any apparel that depicted support for the Black Lives Matter movement for fear that it could be, quote, misunderstood and potentially incite violence, according to a company mem memo. However, just two days after this memo was leaked publicly and outrage started to pour in on social media, Starbucks swiftly changed their position, announcing proudly, we, hear, we see you, we hear you, Black Lives Matter, 
That is a fact and will never change. Wear your BLM. I'm doing a dramatic reading. I hope you see that. This is just my own thing. I'm pretending that I'm Starbucks management here. Wear your BLM pin or t-shirt. We are so proud of your passionate support of our common humanity. Starbucks did not stop there, however. Shortly after, they also produced their own t-shirts in support of BLM for employees to buy and wear, which featured images of placards with political slogans such as no justice, no peace, time for change, and Black Lives Matter. Beneath the images sits the tagline, it's not a moment, it's a movement. Considering that they had tried to silence this very movement only a few days prior to this, it is clear that the change of heart was entirely to do with protecting the brand image of Starbucks. After all, they risked losing a lot of money as a result of a PR disaster, much like the Aunt Jemima case. And, and lots of forms of corporate branding of intersectionality is about this kind of rep rep reputational management rather than challenging racial and gendered uh, injustice. What unites all of these examples that I've shown is the reactive way in which corporate culture responds to the popular and political energy behind anti-racist um, activism and feminist activism. Within capitalist systems where businesses are constantly required to meet consumers' expectations, what happens when the majority of consumers lose interest in a particular issue or movement? In 2020, it became a financial necessity for companies to speak up about BLM and to brand themselves as intersectional. But as the momentum behind the movement simmered down, at least temporarily, so too did the branding response. Indeed, it's, it is not in the economic interest of private companies to challenge the very power structures upon which they thrive. The fickleness with which companies picked up these issues and then dropped them once the public appetite had waned speaks to the way in which the branding of intersectionality operates. As Nathan Zed put it at the end of his video, just a reminder for some people who are going to be done after this week and never have to think about black people again until the next time this blows up. Some of you guys can do that and the rest of us are still going to be black. So to conclude, in a 2017 lecture in Barcelona, Angela Davis reflected on the nature of intersectionality and revolution at the current moment. She highlighted the fundamental disconnect between capitalism as a structure and the progressive intersectional politics of anti-racism and feminism. In her words, she says, if we stand up against racism, we want much more than inclusion. Inclusion is not enough. Diversity is not enough. And as a matter of fact, we do not wish to be included in a racist society. If we say no to heteropatriarchy, then we do not want to be assimilated into a misogynist and heteropatriarchal society. If we say no to poverty, we do not want to be contained by a capitalist structure that values profits more than human beings." End quote. In the current moment, we're seeing a significant rise in the commodification and branding of political movements and political concepts like intersectionality. It's tempting to believe that this marks some kind of progress in society. And as much as at least intersectional politics and intersectionality as a concept have become so mainstream that even corporate culture has jumped on the bandwagon. But I'm arguing here that in a capitalist society where companies trade on their image, images of wokeness, anti-racist messages have become another commodity to be packaged by marketing and PR executives, incapable of providing any meaningful challenge to existing inequitable relations of power. Branding intersectionality is something to, to fill display windows. It is a trapping to, that is thrown on a faceless mannequin. And through this process of filling cultural display windows from influencers to Instagram to corporations, the structural and political substance of intersectionality risk being hollowed out, leaving only an empty signifier behind, a vessel for selling products. Thanks. Well, thank you so much. This was such um, 
Uh, such an interesting and energizing talk. Intersectionality really has made it into corporate culture. I, I have a corporate partner who tells me a lot about um, what's going on there, and corporations really care, and they have incorporated the word intersectionality. It's going around, and um, nobody knows what it means, but um, uh, it reminds me of what Sarah Ahmed says about uh, the stickiness with certain, it becomes kind of associated with you know having more women in higher positions, and um, and that's it, and that's where it stops, um, regardless of whether they're white or not, and all of those kinds of things. Um, also, I think uh, um, it, you provide such a great um, trajectory of how, uh, and thank you for finishing with um, this thought for, from uh, Angela Davis about capitalism, because this really is an example of how neoliberal capitalism has the the amazing flexibility and ability to cannibalize critiques of itself and to render them in such a way that they can no longer be mobilized as critiques of itself. Um, and that is just such a vicious circle because when are we ever going to have a conversation about how capitalism doesn't work um, and it's not a just and it's never going to be a just system in the end of the day, when I teach course on feminism, I actually end up talking more about capitalism than feminism, really. Uh, but it's not about me. Uh, we have a respondent here. Um, and so I want to give uh, Hornaz a chance to um, respond to your talk and um, kind of propose some topics, some questions, um, and um, then you'll have a chance to respond, and then we'll go one more time. Okay. All right. I just want to say again that we are so honored to have you with us here and your presence will be a very memorable part of our school's anniversary. Thank you for your amazing talk. There is a lot to unpack and uh, English is not my first language, so please bear with me as I go through my notes here. So you discussed how intersectionality is emptied of its transformative potential and what was radical and counter-hegemonic is now depoliticized and neutralized and trivialized. Um, I wanted to focus on the representational aspect of intersectionality that you talked about. Um, I think one of the, this is a perspective of a student here. So I think one of the areas in which a co-opted and popular version of intersectionality manifests itself is within neoliberal discourses of EDI, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And like how Sarah Ahmed talks about um, the politics of documentation. So we see a sort of bureaucratized uh, diversity, and I mean diversity as an end in itself, that attempts to sort of reimagine and rebrand uh, or merely change the perception of an institution. And this rebranding conceals systematic racism. Uh, so EDI has become part of this engine of how universities operate and part of the neoliberal logic of inclusion. There is this economy of visibility, using your words here, when it comes to these practices of diversification. And as part of this popularization of inter intersectionality, there are initiatives where racialized faculty and racialized students are recruited in different capacities uh, to appear in a, appear quote unquote, in a highly conspicuous manner, but they are not supported or resourced uh, when their politics do not align with university. So, um, I just want to talk about a very timely example that we witnessed a few days ago. York University, these institutions, some of them are really close to home. York University in Toronto threatened, for example, to revoke students' union status because of students' statement in support of Palestine. So these students who are being silenced are the exact same bodies that are being upheld very visibly within uh, the university's EDI metrics. Uh, so basically, universities market themselves based on that demographic. So my question for you is that 
what, like how can we reclaim and redeploy intersectionality from its performative corporate speech and use it as an effective epistemic device against oppressive systems. And also, how do you, in your capacity as the dean of Annenberg School, uh, apply intersectionality in a, a liberation-minded manner? That was an amazing um, set of comments and really, really, really important questions. Uh, and I think you should never preface it by saying this is coming from a student. That was just like an expansive and capacious way of thinking about this. Um, so your question is, you know, how do we get out of a bureaucratized, I like your term, the bureaucratized diversity in higher ed. I mean, I think first of all, we, I think we need to acknowledge what diversity means in higher ed. It's a huge business. Um, you know, you hire people to be your diversity officers and, and they are, you know, administrative officers who are paid way more than any faculty of color that are, you know, that they're supposedly advocating for. So I think that um, in as much as in the talk I was talking about branding as something that is about representation but not structural or political intersectionality, if we want to change DEI and ED, what we call it DEI, what do you call it? EDI. EDI. Um, DEI, EDI. Um, if we want to actually ha have it have some kind of teeth, then we need to actually look at structural and political intersectionality. We need to put, we actually need to support faculty of color. We need to hire more faculty of color. We need to not say, isn't this great? We have one black faculty member on our, in, in, you know, in, in our community. We need to actually put resources behind a kind of a way to shift structural racism and political racism rather than just have it be representational um, uh, intersectionality. I will also say that um, there are lots of studies and I know lots of people um, who have talked to me about this you know, in great detail that the representational intersectionality, the visibility of in higher ed of being a student like these Palestinian students who, who were sanctioned, you said, at York. Um, uh, the, the visibility of them as both the symbols of diversity, but then they are policed and over-policed and, and disciplined. Um, it is, um, what's that? Put on leave. Oh, they were put on. They were put on. They were put on leave. Yeah, um, yeah. There were the, the, there were students that occupied a building at Brown University last week who were just. Um, they weren't put on leave, but they were all arrested. Um, you know, um, for uh, you know a peaceful protest. So it's happening. This is really happening all over the place, and um, and it, it just reminds me again about the kind of politics of visibility. Um, I remember years and years ago, I used to teach uh, to my undergraduates about how diversity as inclusion is not is is about visibility. And we use I used to show a brochure from the University of Wisconsin that was their recruiting brochure for undergraduates that featured like a football game. And like all the all the people wearing like the red for the Wisconsin, I don't know what their mascot is, but anyway, something that has red in it. Um, and then there was like one black student, like in the middle of the sea of white faces, and this was the cover of their brochure. And it was quickly found out that that one black face in the whole brochure was photoshopped in. And unfortunately for the PR department of Wisconsin, that student was a very prominent black activist on campus for, uh, for anti-racism. And so it came out like how, how easily it is to use you know, students in the, or to use faces, to use representations in this way. And I think that um, um, graduate students and, 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 and students in general and, and faculty members who 
mentor people of color will tell you that they are often overburdened with this kind of service. So that a faculty, uh, you know, if you have a faculty member who is a person of color and then you admit students of color because there's importance in actually having a mentor who is part of your world, that faculty member becomes the, me the mentor for you know, many different students, is on every diversity committee. I was at the London School of Economics for, um, for three years, and one of the requirements there was that in any search committee, you had to have a faculty member who was a, pers who was a person of color. You don't have, they, there weren't that many faculty of color at the LSE. So the same faculty members were on every search committee, right? Because it was mandated in the name of diversity that you would have a, you know, a, a, this kind of representation. So you can see how it becomes absolutely about transaction and not about transformation. Um, so, so I think that, you know, I don't know how to answer the question about how, um, how, how what we do to change it, except for I think we need to change diversity from being a business and from being transactional into being something that is transformational. And, and how do we do that? We do that by putting resources in you know, faculty and student scholarships and supporting, in supporting people, um, not by hiring more and more super, super expensive diversity officers who then give us another online training, um, you know, about how to recognize racism when it happens, you know. Um, so so that's, that's my answer to there. I'm, um, the other one is what do I do as a dean? First of all, I've been a dean for three months, okay? So, you know, I'm still, I'm still mapping out my project. Um, um, how, how do, um, um, I think that um, what I try to do, I don't know if I'm always successful, but what I try to do um, we, we, are, we were talking earlier about this. Um, the University of Pennsylvania is in crisis right now um, over uh, the war against Palestine, um, over the Hamas attack. We have many different constituents, constituents on campus that are feeling really um, uh, unheard and unseen. Um, people are hurting, people are grieving. Um, uh, Islamophobia is, you know, is is rampant on campus. There are, um, a, you know, acts of anti-Semitism as well. And so, I'm trying to figure out what to do. And actually, I deeply believe in 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 you know, changing structures. Um, how I do it in a time when I don't have the answers for people who are asking me to like be, you know, to, to, to change things um, is really hard. I think, um, I think that uh, what, I, what I'm not going to do is, you know, create a task force. <laughs> I'm just going to say task force are, you know, one of my friends, Angie Valdivius, once said that task force are where social action goes to die. And I actually think that that's kind of true. Um, I, I'm not going to form a committee that is about how about that is a DEI committee, but instead think about ways to be um, compassionate and listen to people and, and to actually take a risk and challenge what seems to be common sense in a university because universities are spaces of change and they're not gonna change if we don't, you know, insist on it. And so, um, so yeah, so that's my three months in answer um, to your question. I'm going to just quickly, while you compose yourself for your second question, jump in to say, this really makes me think about reputational management, um, which is something you mentioned, I wrote it down, because there, there is a fear of, um, I mean, I think working in institutions is so difficult, right? Because institutions are such entrenched structures. And uh, yeah, I happen like yourself to believe that, you know, change is possible. I mean, I have to believe that, otherwise, I don't know, um, but would you, yeah, I, I, it makes me think that um, 
there's not space to make mistakes as a leader very easily and um, without having to fear reputational manage how to manage your reputation, whether it's a person as a leader or an institution as a leader. Um, that's one of the structures I think that needs to change because it's not easy work to figure out what to do in really inflamed, um, complicated situations. Yeah, I mean, um, no, it is it is not easy easy work to do. I, I think that we're, and, and I don't want to speak for anyone here, I think, I'll just speak for myself, I think we've been really scared into thinking that reputational management is like the key thing that we <clears throat> have to keep at the forefront all the time. And of course, you know, reputational management is, is important when you're in an institute of higher education. But there are things that you can do and things that you can say that I think that we have just become really, um, really used to not doing and not saying. And I think things like instead of being a, you know, a, you know I, I'm the dean of the school, that doesn't mean that I can't actually collaborate with faculty and students about what we would like to say um, during this moment or how we would like to diversity to look like, you know, to look like where do we want to put resources um, instead of putting them and, and, you know, this pot over here, what if we, uh, you know, get, created a different sort of set of re resources for faculty of color or for students of color? And I think that, you know, that to think collaboratively and not competitively is sort of the key. Yeah, thank you very much so. Hurnaz. I'm interested to know if, whether your own work has ever been used or co-opted in a manner inconsistent with its emancipatory aim. Wow, that's a good question. Well, let's see, I have a book that came out in June that I co-authored with Catherine Higgins called Believability, Sexual Violence, Media, and the Politics of Doubt. And we began the book with a kind of detailing of the Amber Heard, Johnny Depp trial. Let me tell you, the Johnny Depp fans are no joke, right? Um, I'm sorry if any of you are a Johnny Depp fan. Um, um, so recently there was a like right wing screed written about the book in a, in a national paper in Australia um, where basically this person um, took our couple of paragraphs about Amber Heard in which we said that regardless of the complexities of the case, and we weren't making a, an argument about the case, we were, what we were saying is that every bit of evidence that was presented in that case worked to establish Amber Heard as a liar, as someone to not be believed, right? And so we said that, and this, this, um, this review of the book called us, <laughs> squirmy fangirls of Amber Heard because we said that she was, she was paint, you know, kind of targeted as a, as a liar instead. And it was like, so it was a Johnny Depp fan who came after the book who probably read like the first couple of pages because we actually talk for like 200 more pages about other things in that book. Um, but um, that was the thing that it was kind of like used against us to talk about, you know, Johnny Depp. Um, I, I have been asked before if I could consult on um, different brand campaigns after I published Authentic. <laughs> Let me tell you, I am not a good brand consultant. You can only imagine. But, you know, after I wrote that book, um, I, there's lots of people, including people at the university, you know, where it's just like, oh, Sarah, you, you know, you wrote about brand culture. We need to figure out how to brand this part of USC. And it's like, that isn't, I'm not good at that. Believe me, you don't want me on your committee. Um, so, so there's, there's been that. Um, uh, misogynists come after you. Um, um, so when you write about misogyny, um, you're going to get people who um, will tell you how wrong you are. Um, I was interrupted during a talk once in London um, by a gentleman who said, um, I was talking about confidence culture, 
after Empowered came out and he stood up and he was like, you feminists have no evidence. There is no evidence for a gender pay gap, which is by the way, patently false. There's plenty of empirical evidence that there is a gender pay gap. But then he's like, and Harvey Weinstein, you have no evidence for her. And I'm like, dude, he admitted it. I mean, it's like, he's giving us the evidence. But the key thing was that I didn't talk about either of those things in my talk. I mean, I didn't, and I'm I'm quite sure that this man had not read my book, which I talk about in those uh, those things a little bit. So there was like, uh, you know, I think there was like a network of these these people who came to public talks that were given by feminists in the UK at a particular moment that had an agenda, and the agenda was the gender pay gap. That was a huge um, point of contention in the UK, and so they would just go from talk to talk and say, "This is, you know, you have no evidence. Feminists have no evidence." So, so. I would say that that is is not actually using my work because I don't think that you know in any of those cases anyone read my work, including the review um, about believability. But that it was what what we had said or a kernel of an argument that I had made was then uh, distorted into something that I wasn't actually talking about. Hornells, would you like to respond or ask any any more questions? <laughs> um, well, uh, I I'm very tempted to take this privilege that I have to be on stage and ask, sneak in one question before I open the floor for questions, which is, you know, in the same way that you establish how the visibility of popular feminism kind of engenders this uh, these uh, popular misogyny, reactionary movements and actions, um, I want to know your thoughts about um, the kind of counterparts to this popularization of intersectionality and it becoming this, you know, new, you know, mantra and, and brand um, in popular cu culture. You kind of alluded in the very beginning that there's been, you know, a definite rise in, in far right. Um, and, and I just, I can't stop thinking about people who, um, I mean, you see on social media, um, being interviewed for for some real who who are at Trump rallies and who can who are against critical race theory, but to me, like it's just so fantastic that they know the word critical race theory. <laughs> so I mean, I can't stop marveling at that. But I, I I wonder if you have more of a of an articulation of how those two you know counteract. Is movements as, as, as events in society. Yeah, I think when there is a heightened visibility of things like DEI programs about of corporate mandated corporate training, like diversity training, you know, like I began the talk with, um, if you have a heightened visibility of, of Black Lives Matter, um, not just in terms of the way in which it's branded, but in terms of social media and social activism and different ways in which communities and collectivities are coming together to agitate for social justice that is going to cause a reaction. And that visibility um, is, um, is going to be seen as a threat. So it's not a surprise to me that you have um, a, a different kind of victimization going on. So a lot of white nationalist movements in the US at least are about how white people are victims of diversity, right? They're victims of, you know, this, this you know, what they see as a kind of constant, you know, attention being paid to racial inequality um, where, um, you know, where they are seeing themselves as as the victims. You see this, you know, Trump, you know, um, uh, Trump said, uh, you know, during the Brett Kavanaugh hearings that it was a very scary time for young white men in America, you know, because because Kavanaugh was accused of sexual harassment. I mean, Kavanaugh is, of course, confirmed as a Supreme Court justice for the rest of his life. And we have seen now exactly what him and other nominees from um, conservative politicians, what that has done to the legal framework in the United States about things like Bro, you know Roe v. Roe Wade, v. Um, Wade, Roe v. Wade, uh, uh, LGBTQ rights. Now the dismantling of affirmative action. So you can see, you know, the visibility itself. I think 
um, is it belies any kind of, or it belies a structural change, right? I mean, because those things are happening, they are being sedimented into the law at the same time as we're seeing, you know, like these intersectionality mugs being sold, right? And so I think that um, we need to see this as whenever something like this becomes any, you know, social justice, especially for marginalized communities, becomes something visible. Um, and 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 more commonplace, so that you have politicians saying none of them understand what critical race theory is. By the way, I mean, but you know, but they're saying you know we're gonna you know. So whenever that happens, you see actual material um, changes. You see the banning of books. You know, you see the the takeover of complete states and governments by white nationalism. And so I think that, you know, it's it's something that we need to take seriously, that what what is the threat that is caused by visibility? Um, and how do we try to combat that? Absolutely. Thank you so much for this answer. And now, let's open the floor to questions. Hi, thank you. Very much enjoyed your talk. You were talking about the exercise of intersectionality as um, being a branding exercise for corporate entities. And I could see your work kind of intersecting with it on the sort of individual branding front once you were getting to kind of social media and influencer circles. But I was wondering if you could weigh in a little on how it um, blunts the imagination on systems of care that are also not market-based and as well as collectivist. Uh, that's a great question, I, and I actually just told uh, Sarah and Stuart earlier that I was trying to think about what I wanted to write on next, um, and it, I need it to be something that's going to make me feel good, <laughs> um, and um, is going to you know kind of be motivating. And I was thinking about care networks um, and and solidarities. Um, so where do I see care within this kind of landscape? I mean, I think that one of the things that, you know, many people, uh, Sarah Ahmed, uh, Wendy Brown, other people have talked about in terms of the ways in which neoliberal capitalism retracts systems of care and networks of care and services of care from our governments, right, and from the state, so that we don't have care networks to fall back on. And I think, you know, there's arguments to be made about how when you don't have a social system that that cares about care, right? And everything is outsourced, you know, um, and, and not about collectivity or solidarity, but instead about whether or not you can afford a counselor, you know, or whether or not you can afford to be, um, you know, part of a community, then, you know, there is a care deficit. And I think that, um, you know, there have been, um, recent efforts to to reclaim care as a social service, right? As something that we care about, sorry, we care about care, you know, socially and culturally and not something that is just left to the individual to um, deal with. And I think we see that a lot in terms of mental health issues and anxiety, um, um, you know, that have, have, that really have kind of had heightened visibility, especially since COVID, you know, where people are left on their own. And so I think that Crenshaw in thinking about intersectionality is thinking about care. I, I really do think that. I think she's thinking about how it is that we can demonstrate care for a community. Um, I, I just happened to actually be an event uh, uh, on Tuesday night this week with Crenshaw, um, or I went to go see her, um, and, and she has a new book out called Say Her Name, which is about um, black women who have been killed by police in the United States, and there's a lot of attention to black men who have been killed by police, um, and, and she collected stories from mothers and, and, and friends and sisters of black women who have been killed by police in the last several years in the U.S., and, and, and co collected those stories and put them into a collection to read them as an act of care. Right as an act um, of 
of sort of generosity of spirit of grace. And I think that the more that we do that, and this gets back to this idea about competition, you know, um, the, the, if we think about organizing our lives and our professional lives with compassion and care rather than competition, we might start to think about what that might look like, what care might look like as a network or as a community. I don't know if that answers your question. It's a hard question. It's an important one, but. It's a question that needs lots of time to work with. Other questions? Thank you very much. Um, this is something that's kind of been in my mind um, for a while, thinking about intersectionality. And you mentioned neoliberal corporate logic. And I just, it's hard to imagine how any kind of a social movement or something doesn't get co-opted or, um, you know, consumed by this corporate logic and kind of just the the elephant in the room of capitalism in this thought to me or like in this talk. I just you know, this, the oppressions and the intersectionality of oppressions, just like how class and poverty and capitalism just plays such a huge role in that. And there have been speakers kind of more on the socialist or communist or anti-capitalist um, thought process where they maybe think that intersectionality in itself maybe downplays in a sense that thought of the capitalism and the labor part of it. So in a sense, I just, I wanted to get your feeling of how maybe like the weighting and like how much does like uh, capitalism or the commodification in this, that neoliberal corporate logic play into it? Like how important is that really? Okay, so I'm gonna give you kind of a cranky answer to that. Um, for hundreds of years, a certain part of class-based politics have insisted that misogyny and racism are peripheral, peripheral to um, the heart of the movement, which is capitalism, right? Um, and, and that these are, I mean, in, in different moments, feminism has been seen as a distraction. Feminism has been seen as something that dilutes class politics. Um, racism has been seen as something that is, you know, um, happens after we, you know, kind of overthrow capitalism and that kind of thing. So I would say that to that point, um, that if you look at theories of social reproduction, like Silvia Federici, um, um, Bhattacharya, and other people, you will find that there is no way that you can talk about capitalism without talking about gender. So it's not, does it make sense for me to think about capitalism as separate from gender? If you read, if you think about Cedric Robinson, who argues eloquently that there is no capitalism without racial capitalism, then you can see that this is actually about interlocking struggles. And in fact, that to, to focus on, to, to think about class politics or labor as as a as the kind of kernel, I'm not saying you're you're saying this, but a lot of you know a lot of a lot of you know people who are you know kind of um, thinking about class politics, whether or not they're socialist or communist, are thinking about class politics as the kernel, as the key logic. Um, neoliberal, the logic of neoliberal capitalism is about race and gender as much as it is about class, and so I think that that is that is the promise of actually thinking about intersectionality as a point to begin with, not as a point to get to, you know? And so, um, you know, I think that that's my cranky answer is that as a feminist, my entire career, I've often been told that, you know, basically some version of we'll get to gender later. Right, um, you know that kind of you know by people are like, but class politics are the are the thing, and I think that and the, I was trained as a historical materialist. I you know f I I really see the absolute centrality of you know of class politics and class identity. I don't see it as separate 
from gender identity or racial identity. In fact, I think that one of the biggest you know, issues with thinking about how to think about care, for example, is, is, a, is a sidestepping of something like racial capitalism or the, social, or the theories of social reproduction that put, put gender at the you know, center. Does that kind of answer that? Okay. I almost feel like you, what you're responding is to to like the, the the branding of intersectionality because intersectionality has like the, the has what's stuck to it has been these issues of diversity and in and gender and race when actually it is about everything. Yeah. So I think it's so related actually to your main argument in this talk. Um, I think we have. I'd like to make time for one more question. I know we're a little bit over, but. Thank you for such a, a rich talk, Dr. Benemaiser. I wanted to sort of allude to your title and ask a question in the sense of how successful has the branding of intersectionality been? Sort of to nod to what you said initially as a sort of strategy for the shoring up of economic and cultural capital. I guess the question is if, if that has been successful to the degree that has it successfully functioned to become a site of, for the circulation of like the images of representations in a way that shows up capital, and if so, has like that form of intersectionality become a brand? Has it, success has it become branded as opposed to it being an ongoing process, or how successful intersectionality has been as a brand in and of itself? Yeah, it's it's a great question, and I'm glad you asked it too because um, I mean that was kind of a depressing talk, um, and and um, I think that actually your comments, your question, the question about care, the question about class, and where do, you know these are all questions that are about like kind of like is is this all there is. Right? Is this is this all you know? All we can think about, and I think that there are ways in which intersectionality has become successful as a brand, um, in the sense of you know, um, like certain corporations have used it in a way that are maybe attached to other material politics, like not just uh, window dressing, you know, as English would argue, but rather something that is connected to programs or policies or resources that are given to, you know, actual, um, to, to thinking about racial discrimination or gender discrimination. I think that you can think, you can see, um, like outrage at these. I mean, the Pepsi ad, you know the Pepsi ad was pulled, right? I mean, people were like, this is such bullshit. How can you actually, I mean, when you think about that ad and think about what it is, it, you know, the different, the different kinds of tropes that are used in that ad, and it was almost immediately pulled, and then Kendall Jenner said, I'm really, I really regret doing that, and there's a lot of pushback. I mean, and I think so. I think that, you know, if this is the last question, I would like to like end on pushback. You know, that we there are there are parts of online communities, um, Black Twitter, for example, that was instrumental in in pointing out some of these brand fails, right, and some of the ways in which they reveal, you know, more, you know, that they reinforce racism, like with the influencers, rather than challenge it. Um, there are, you know, star. Starbucks was um, kind of a brand fail. Uh, bon Appetit was another big um, story during this time um, that where people, you know, actually left the company and the company has plummeted because of their sort of weak response to an accusation of racism. And so I think that there is room here to push back. There is room here to be transformative and not just transactional, you know. Um, and and so, I mean, I think I think your question is a good one. Um, I never know how to answer whether or not a brand has been successful. You know, I think that the most successful brands are the ones that don't use typical brand campaigns. You know, um, that are the ones that are about community oriented and word of mouth, and not some slickly, per, you know, produced 
ad um, that just uses you know stock images and stock stereotypes as a way to tell their story. And so um, I ne I don't even know what kind what brand necessarily is successful. I you know something like Dove and their Real Beauty campaign. It's a pretty successful ad in the sense that they have just made more and more money off of it. It's also something that like there's a you know a ton of papers written about it and and how it's a problem. So there's there's ambivalence there, you know, um, and I think that ambivalence, the beauty of ambivalence is that we can push back. We can resist transactional, you know, identities and, and, and think about what a transformational identity or practice might look like. Um, so some of them have been successful, I guess. Um, diversity is a big business. Um, there's lots and lots of money that com companies put into diversity, um, but if success means that, you know, that actually there's racial equality, then they haven't been successful, right? So, um, so I think it's it's a good, it's an interesting question, and I think it's an important one, um, and I think the answer is that we need to think about it in terms of ambivalence rather than whether or not it actually, you know can be seen as a success or a failure. But I was going to say thank God for Dove because they're they're always providing content, endless content for us to critique in our classrooms. I know. I think that I sometimes like <laughs> schedule a whole syllabus around different Dove ads. Like today we're going to do this one. Here's the social no media way, one. No way. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, thank you so much. With this, I'm going to wrap up this talk. And um, yeah. Let me begin by um, thanking you, Sarah. I want you to know, uh, Milena began with this, so let me say that your work has been part of our curriculum, as part of our undergraduate, graduate courses. I think many people in this room have chosen your work uh, to use to bring students into these conversations that you've shared with us today, to recognize the extractivist work of branding and the way in which your talk captures that extraction process, I thought is uh, one of the kind of uh, powerful messages that we walk away with here. You will know that extractivism is a powerful animating principle for social movements and a way of responding to capitalism and how capitalism is operating today. And you've reminded us again of the long history of how branding is a practice, a process, an institutional set of relationships, a social structure, as uh, was mentioned, of, within capitalism of extractivist relationships that in, in, uh, continues to uh, make hidden the deep realities that hold us together as community, as people ho with hope for better futures. And so much thanks for what you've done and shared. And now I want to say that what you need to know is that Sarah is on a plane tomorrow morning at 4.30 in the morning from us. Her willingness to come out and join us today on, I, I think, less than 48 hours on the West Coast, traveling six hours here, six hours back, speaks to the effort she has made. And so from us, I want to say with great, great gratitude, thank you so much for coming and being thank with us. Thank you for having me. I also, um, I also want to um, extend much thanks to Milena who stepped in on short notice um, to act as moderator today. I'm very grateful for your enthusiasm and your willing. And most of all, to Hurnas, whose um, willingness to step on stage and take the role of respondent and questioner was brilliant, as all of us in the room expected, um, except yourself, perhaps, but all of us <laughs> expected that. And it came through exactly as we thought. So thank you, Hurnas. Thank you, Melanie. Um, I have the pleasure now of closing and reminding everyone that our next event will be on December 1st and 2nd. And on December 1st, we have uh, as the opening to a weekend research symposium, which features current, past uh, faculty in the school, st graduate students in the school whose work wraps around the critical themes that we've um, uh, taken up in our fall program. And that program opens with a keynote by uh, the indigenous scholar, curator, artist Dylan Robinson, which will take place on December 1st, the evening of December 1st, at the World Arts Center at um, Woodward's. 
So I want to remind everyone of that. I think it's going to be a brilliant event that we're all really very much looking forward to. The research symposium follows on the next day, which will feature, as I've mentioned, former um, graduate students who have gone on to fantastic careers in media and communication studies, our current crop of remarkable graduate students and faculty members. So please come and join us for that. And on that, my job here is done. I am grateful for your attendance and spending time with us. Thank you so much and have a great evening. <laughs>